Okay. <clears throat> We're actually going to start talking about the fighting of the war today. Uh, and uh, I want to um, emphasize uh, a couple of things from the start. <clears throat> uh, the first is, well, we'll be talking about a campaign today, and, and, and talking about a specific uh, military strategy, which becomes known as Blitzkrieg. Um, we're going to be talking about more than that. We're not simply kind of talking about the order of battle and talking about uh, who invaded where when, uh, but rather uh, we're going to be talking about the ways in which, uh, the, at least in this case, the Germans fought uh, reveals a lot about German priorities, a lot about German society, uh, and a lot about uh, German capacity for fighting this war. Uh, so uh, it's instructive that it's not simply about the um, uh, sort of uh, the way in which this war is fought, uh, but also the the reasons behind uh, tactical and strategic choices uh, that are made. So that's where I would like to go, uh, at least um, uh, initially today. <coughs> For the Germans, the, as I mentioned, the goal of autarky, of complete self-sufficiency, uh, remained the priority. That was the reason why Germany uh, uh, struck out on its own. That's why the reason why uh, uh, the Germans pursued uh, the sort of strategy uh, that they did. The first thing we ought to remember is that for the Germans, well, we know a lot about their conquests to the West into France, their, their, their bombing of, uh, of Britain uh, in 1940 and 1941. Uh, what can get lost a little bit is the fact that the conquests in the West are a distraction, or are, a, if not a distraction, uh, are secondary, or were secondary, to their larger efforts, which are to the East. For Nazi Germany, the key to autarky was something called Lebensraum, L-E-B-E-N-S-R-A-U-M, which technically means living room, room to live. But it didn't mean that Germany was overpopulated and needed to spread out. Rather, it meant the empire that Germany needed to create that would allow them to control natural resources. Food supplies, things like petroleum, coal and iron, uh, all sorts of precious metals, all of these were located to the east, in Poland and especially in the Soviet Union. From the start of his regime, really, from the start of his uh, understanding of this plan of Lebensraum, or his embrace of this idea of Lebensraum, Hitler and his command had their eyes here on the western part of the Soviet Union and the southwestern part, up, up against the Black Sea. <clears throat> Everything that happens in Western Europe is designed to facilitate, really, this conquest. Everything for the Germans is ultimately going to be about the conquest of this part of the Soviet Union. Everything builds to that, which makes it perhaps the more remarkable that this is the effort that the Germans fall down on, that this is the effort that the Germans uh, ultimately do not plan adequately for and are unable to carry out. So this is the first thing we have to understand, is that this goal, Lebensraum, is about controlling resources, controlling populations, controlling and, and really having captive labor, it's based on understanding that the population out here, a largely Slavic population, is inferior to Germans and that it is really only useful as labor. The other thing that we'll be talking about later on when we come to talk more about the Holocaust is that by extending their control to the east, the Germans also begin to bring under their control millions of Eastern European Jews in Poland and in the Soviet Union, exposing those Jews for the first time to the strictures of the Nazi regime with its various restrictions on what Jews might or might not do. The history of the Holocaust is entwined with the history of this campaign, that's called known as the Campaign in the East. 
So that's the first thing you have to keep in mind. Lebensraum, the focus on the Soviet Union, these are the fundamental motivating factors for the Germans when they um, uh, go to war in 1939. Everything is part of this larger plan. Having established, or having, they believe, established uh, a claim to Poland, a claim to um, uh, at least uh, this part of Poland up here. In September of 1939, they used the excuse of Polish so-called atrocities towards Germans, Polish antagonism towards ethnic Germans living in these areas. They used that as an excuse to invade. Having made their famous non-aggression pact with the Soviets earlier that summer, uh, uh, the Germans are able to invade make significant inroads in the first two weeks of their invasion, at which point the Soviets then come in from further east. And the Germans and the Soviets wind up dividing Poland among themselves. Now there's a couple of things. The Polish example, what happens in Poland is, in some senses, a microcosm of what the Germans are going to do in the east. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Then we'll switch to talk about the west and then come back to the east. Um, but what we have to understand, Poland is, for the Germans, sort of a test run, the first test run to the east. After it's been established what they can do, then the Germans will turn to the west, largely to rid themselves of any need, they think, to, to worry about Western Europe any further, and then they'll turn back to the east. So that's one thing you have to understand. Poland is going to be the place where the Germans are going to try out various administrative and organizational uh, uh, structures to run a captive Poland, where their treatment of Poles, uh, Jewish and non-Jewish alike, is going to be indicative of how they're going to treat other populations, especially further east, and where the tactics that will be employed further east are given, you might say, a thorough rehearsal. Uh, so actually, I'm going to turn to the tactics first, and then we will... Um, I uh, uh, continue from there. The big sort of takeaway or the big historical phrase or idea uh, that tends to be associated with the Germans in this part of the, this early stage of the war is what's called the Blitzkrieg. Literally meaning lightning war. Blitzkrieg is a very specific type, or what comes to be known as Blitzkrieg. It's really only sort of given this title very late in the day uh, to describe it. That is, the German high command um, never really thought of this in sort of one way, Blitzkrieg. Rather, what they thought of this was simply the most efficient way to fight. <coughs> Blitzkrieg has various elements built into it that are, again, indicative of how the Germans are going to act elsewhere in Europe and are indicative of how this war is going to be fought. Blitzkrieg is dependent on several things. In the first place, it's dependent on mechanized movement, what you might call mechanized mobility. That is, unlike even in the First World War, where many tacticians and strategists we're thinking about the use of large numbers of soldiers, even though the Germans will invade Poland uh, or will uh, bring uh, uh, at least a million troops to the border with Poland before invading, the Germans are all about the mechanized elements. Not simply tanks, although tanks will be sort of the centerpiece, uh, that is, the use of armor, but also the use of mechanized artillery pieces, that can be carried either on trucks or on uh, railway cars. The use of trucks and automobiles as transit to move troops as quickly as possible. And the complete coordination of armor on the ground with air power. That is, the Germans are going to use air power use their capacity to bomb both Polish military positions and Polish civilian areas, like Warsaw, for example, they're going to use air power now as, you might say, sort of their version of artillery. What in the First World War, you'd had to use these sort of fixed artillery pieces to so-called soften up the ground or soften up the enemy before attacking. Now you could use air power. 
air power which could provide cover, which could be directed from the ground at times. And air power had a further element. It allowed you to strike much further and to move more quickly into enemy territory than previously you might have done. Because what Blitzkrieg is about, it's about movement, as I said, mobility of mechanized forces, forces that can bring an enormous amount of destruction, an enormous amount of firepower to bear. It's designed to take advantage of infrastructure, roads in particular, paved roads, to strike at urban centers. It's designed to go past even uh, concentrations of troops. It's designed to go past certain strategic points to capture even more important ones, to capture urban areas. That is, this mechanized mobility basically allows you to bring an enormous amount of firepower in a very, very short period of time. The idea being that you will surprise, overwhelm, and demoralize. This is a big element, the demoralization, the bombing, that, um, the bombing, the rapid movement of troops will lead to not only the, the, the demoralization of the fighting forces you're opposing, but also the civilian population. That is, this is total war. It's an understanding that civilians are part of the war effort, whether materially supporting it or psychologically even supporting it. The idea is you quickly destroy the morale of those fighting and those behind the lines. So for the Germans, it means uh, using uh, close to 2,000 tanks. It means using close to 2,000 aircraft. It means um, getting swift, not just swift victories, but dealing swift psychological victories through the bombardment of civilian areas, through the rapid encirclement of troops. Again, it's not about progressing and capturing every spot along the way. It's about striking very quickly and identifying key targets, taking them, and then depending on those to demoralize the enemy. Now, there's a rationale behind this, but it's not perhaps the rationale that, that sort of popular history uh, might present. The rationale usually presented is, well, it's designed to demoralize. That's why it's so quick. That's why you have to strike. That's why the Germans came up with this, because it's a psychologically very powerful um, uh, way uh, to invade and to conquer. That's true. It's psychologically very powerful. It's a speed. It's a use and distribution of firepower like Europe had never seen. But the real rationale is this. It's not a sign of simply German military innovation. It's also a sign of German weakness. This is something that has to be understood. That this Blitzkrieg model, or lightning war model, is embraced because it's designed to produce quick knockout victories. Victories in which an enemy is demoralized and surrenders. It's designed to do so because the Germans, even in 1939 and early 1940, did not yet have the full industrial capacity. In fact, they might never have the full industrial capacity um, to fight a long-term prolonged war. That is, the whole idea of Lebensraum, the whole idea of conquest to the east of getting access to oil and refineries and mines and labor and foodstuffs. All of these were necessary for Germany to be able to fight the sort of prolonged war it imagined it might have to fight eventually. But until they had these, that's the thing, until they controlled Poland, Ukraine, the Caucasus down in the southern part of the Soviet Union where they, had, they could gain oil, uh, until they could do that, the Germans did not have the industrial resource base to fight a long-term war. So in essence, they had to fight these quick wars in order to gain the territory that would allow them ultimately to fight this 
long term. Is everyone with me so far? It's a recognition that in what, and this will, a phrase that will recur again and again, that in what's going to ultimately become a war of production, the Germans understood that while they had a lot of industrial capacity, while they had the ability to innovate, they didn't have all the natural resources they needed to fight a long-term war of attrition, you might say. They needed control of those. Only with control of those could Germany be self-sufficient, self-reliant, and defend itself completely. <clears throat> so the use of Blitzkrieg, the use of these lightning war tactics, is a demonstration that the German government, the German military planners in particular, understood their vulnerability and believed that this was the only way in which they could act. Is everyone, any questions about this? So while it is designed, yes, to, to have this sort of psychological blow, what we have to understand is, is that there's a deeper rationale there. The Germans are acting out of real sort of, uh, you might say, uh, industrial or economic necessity. They can't afford to fight the long-term conflict. They don't have the resources for it yet. So this is the kind of conflict they're going to fight. This is the innovation. It's, it's not necessarily something that emerges simply because of, of German military inventiveness. It's a, it's, it's a function of German industrial and economic necessity. The fact that they do not yet control the territory, the labor, the resources uh, uh, to fight a full-scale war. That's one of the things. For the Germans, this conquest of Lebensraum is dependent upon ultimately knocking out the Soviet Union and in many ways ensuring that Britain and or the United States do not commit to long-term war against the Germans. Those are the only places that could sustain long-term wars of production. For the Germans, ultimately, the real problem they're going to have is the fact that they will be facing the Soviet Union and Britain and the United States by early 1942, which means they will be massively outproduced. And the Germans know this from the start. It's a similar thing to what the Japanese have. The Japanese, seeking to extend their imperial control in Southeast Asia, are trying to gather enough resources because they know they can't win a war of production on their own either. So Blitzkrieg, again, is this function of um, uh, economic and industrial necessity. Um, uh, this will just give you an idea. Um, uh, for the Germans, the German uh, uh, production uh, of, um, uh, of aircraft, of weaponry generally, is going to increase over the war, or over the course of most of the war. In 1940, 1941, it's still not as productive as it's going to get. That is, the period of 42, 43 is when the Germans control more resources, when the Germans uh, begin to control sort of slave labor populations, begin to throw everything in the economy towards industrial military production or military industrial production. Uh, it's not something uh, that is uh, necessarily... Uh, there from the start of the war. Um, and if you look, for example, at um, uh, Germany's ability uh, to produce tanks, the German ability to produce tanks will increase. But at least initially, German tank capacity is not overwhelmingly great at the start of the war compared to others. And of course, the other thing is that compared to the Americans and the Soviets, the Germans are never going to be able to outproduce them. So this illustrates two things. The first is that the, compared to where they'll be later in the war, the Germans don't have um, the, as many uh, uh, mechanized pieces at the start of the war. And secondly, that even when they begin to operate at absolute breakneck speed, an absolute sort of crash, industri crash military industrialization, they're never able to keep up with the Soviets and the Americans. Um, uh, and uh, you can see by 1942, and especially by 1943, 
uh, just how remarkable uh, American production is. Uh, it tails off a little bit because the Americans begin to produce, focus more on producing aircraft, uh, but the Soviets continue with tanks in 1944 uh, and into 1945. <coughs> Pardon me. Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, so this is the deal with Blitzkrieg. It is about quick strikes in order to gain industrial capacity, to gain resources that will allow you to fight long-term wars. Similarly, in the western part of Europe, after Poland is knocked out in the fall of 1939, in the spring of 1940, the Germans will turn their attentions to the west. Um, this is the German invasion of France uh, in May, June 1940. Uh, it's not just France, but Belgium, Luxembourg, uh, ultimately several Scandinavian countries, the Netherlands, uh, all will be overrun by the Germans in the spring and early summer of 1940. This is not, as I've mentioned, about Lebensraum. The idea is not the Germans will somehow settle here. Rather, it's about taking what resources are available here, especially those in, in these parts of eastern France, uh, but ultimately it's about knocking out potential opponents. Knocking out the French, securing, in essence, Germany's western borders, and... Uh, uh, at least in the theory, is uh, so intimidating Britain that Britain will not continue the fight against the Germans. Um, and again, in France, you have the use of this blitzkrieg. That is, highly mobile uh, army, for, uh, mechanized uh, groups uh, moving very quickly, encircling French forces, um, attacking the heavily fortified French-German border here, where the French had created, since the end of the First World War, what was called the Maginot Line, M-A-G-I-N-O-T, the Maginot Line, which was a very static defense position. Miles and miles of concrete bunkers, barracks, um, gun emplacements, barbed wire, mines, all these sort of things that seem very reminiscent of the First World War. Uh, uh, and to be honest with you, uh, the Germans mostly went around it. Uh, you have, uh, in the case of um, uh, uh, the Germans attacking uh, in um, the 1940, uh, uh, this is the northern part of the French border. You have the Maginot Line, which ran up most of the French border, but it didn't come all the way up here to where Belgium is. So the Germans, of course, came from Belgium. That's sort of the traditional German way of starting a war at this point. It um, was to go through Belgium uh, and Luxembourg, uh, surround the French, who sort of moved this way, and cut them off. Down here is the Maginot Line, which no one really bothered with. You can still see, on the Franco-German border to this day, you can still see empty bunkers on the Maginot Line. Um, some of them untouched by any sort of uh, uh, ammunition or rifle fire or artillery uh, because the Germans simply went around them uh, and went through Belgium. <coughs> in knocking out France in about six weeks in May, June uh, 1940, in a period of massive confusion among the French uh, military leadership and French political leadership, um, uh, a victory that involved not only taking on French and Belgian forces but ultimately about half a million British troops rushed over in uh, May of 1940. Um, you see again, you might say, the efficacy or the workability of Blitzkrieg. But there's something here that happens in the French case, in the case of the invasion of France, that illustrates that Blitzkrieg is a little bit problematic and that Blitzkrieg is not perhaps the perfect solution, although the lessons don't seem to have been learned uh, quite at the time. Well, Blitzkrieg allows the Germans to move very quickly through the forested areas here uh, on the Belgian-Luxembourg-French uh, uh, border and allows them to surround forces very quickly. The problem is this. Blitzkrieg moves fast, and sometimes it moves too fast. Um, the French put up, and the French and British put up, really at times, only sort of minimal opposition. The result is, by late May, early June, you have armored formations, mechanized divisions of the German army 
uh, uh, tank divisions in particular, which have become so, which have moved so quickly that they have outstripped their logistical support. <coughs> That's the first thing. They have moved so fast that they cannot be supplied or resupplied quickly enough. Logistics can't keep up with the movement. Which means eventually they're going to have to stop. They will reach, there's sort of a finite distance they can go without further logistical support. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. <clears throat> well, these tanks or these mechanized groups will have to, have to stop, they're also going to be limited by the fact that Germany at this point is not yet the industrial powerhouse it hopes to be. These tanks are very valuable. So they cannot be risked. The result is this. In France, um, Blitzkrieg initially uh, appears uh, to work uh, because, as it had in Poland, it strikes quickly and it pushes the enemy up against a barrier. In the case of Poland, they pushed the enemy up against the Soviets, advancing from the other direction. Here, you have them pushed up against the English Channel. But, at this place here, called Dunkirk, D-U-N-K-I-R-K, in June and July 1940, you have half a million or so British and French soldiers trapped. Almost all of them, about 400,000 of them, will escape and make their way back to Britain. They'll be rescued by the Royal Navy, by private vessels, by people using uh, everything from commercial fishing boats to ferries, anything on the southern coast of England that could be mobilized and could stay afloat was sent to Dunkirk. Lots of private citizens, it was seen as sort of, you know, snatching victory from the jaws of defeat, that Britain would fight on, that um, the bulk of the British expeditionary force sent to France in May 1940 would manage to make it back. <coughs> the reason that so many troops are able to escape has to do with these limitations on Blitzkrieg. That is, the Germans managed to close in on the coast, but some of their tanks had begun to run out of fuel, the troops had begun to run out of ammunition, had begun to run out of food, so they had to stop. And the second thing is this. This area here is very marshy. It's sort of a, a tidal area here along the, the, the English Channel. Um, it's a place where German tank commanders were worried that they were simply going to lose tanks to the conditions. Blitzkrieg works very well when there's lots of paved roads. Once it has to go off the paved roads and chase people to the beach, then there's a problem. Tanks don't function as well, and you can't afford to lose tanks, at least in this early stage of the war. So Blitzkrieg has its limits. It, people can get up too far ahead, out ahead of supplies, and conditions can work against these mechanized elements uh, uh, in the German military. Uh, whether by making it prohibitive for them to, to venture any further because they'll be exposed in sort of bad conditions, uh, or uh, because their commanders will not want to, at least at this point, risk losing valuable resource like a tank. So Blitzkrieg manages to push people up against this border, but it's a border that ultimately is not completely solid. As I said, close to 400,000 British and French troops, mostly British troops, will escape back to Britain in the summer, in June, July 1940, from Dunkirk. It's called the Miracle of Dunkirk. This retreat is very important for the long-term course of the war. In the first place, it gives Britain a boost of, if not confidence, at least a sense that it will be able, or has a greater chance now, of surviving. That is, in Britain, we have had, we had, had the imposition of a draft, military conscription. Um, the fact that you were able, that they, they still had not 
built up a massive army. The fact that you're able to rescue 300,000 British soldiers gives you now more confidence in your ability to resist um, the Germans. The survival of these soldiers means that in the summer, fall, the summer and fall of 1940, Hitler's going to have to spend more time and spend more time devising, not only more time, but specifically more time devising ways now to try to knock Britain out. <clears throat> because Britain has managed to retain several hundred thousand troops, because Britain itself is not demoralized, in fact, Britain is sort of rallied or cheered by the successful retreat from Dunkirk, Hitler's going to have to put into place an aerial plan a plan to attempt to achieve complete air supremacy over the British Isles, which will be the key to a successful invasion of the British Isles. That is, again, all of these troops survive. Hitler realizes now that Britain is going to fight on. It makes the invasion of Britain now a greater necessity, because Britain is, is going to fight on, which means now that Hitler has to throw a lot of resources, a lot of material and men, into knocking out Britain's air defenses as a prelude to an invasion. So there's sort of a knock-on effect here. Blitzkrieg gets Hitler, France, it knocks out Western Europe for the duration, or almost the duration of the war, but it doesn't succeed by its example in demoralizing Britain, Instead, it sort of, if not cheers Britain up, gives it a greater resolve to fight on. And there's, there, as I said, there are sort of clues here that Blitzkrieg is problematic. That supply lines can be made tenuous, or can become tenuous, uh, and that Blitzkrieg, this mechanized war, is very dependent on terrain and conditions. Either because tanks can't fight in it, or because tank commanders won't risk a valuable resource in it. These are not lessons necessarily appreciated by the German high command. Basically because they're not appreciated by Hitler. Who, in this sort of flush of triumph, is allowed to sort of uh, move and disperse resources without anyone raising any questions at all. I talked about uh, a, a couple of weeks ago this idea of sort of what, what comes to be known as the Hitler myth. That Hitler couldn't do any wrong in foreign policy. The events of 39 and 40, despite what we've, we've sort of learned here in, in, in retrospective analysis of them, these things don't do anything to diminish Hitler's reputation, except now he's not just a foreign policy genius, he's also a military and strategic genius. With these massive triumphs that he's able to engineer fairly quickly. So this is Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg is, I think for us, an understand, uh, uh, understanding Blitzkrieg means in particular relating it to the fact that this is going to be a massive war of production, the Germans know it, and that it's not necessarily um, uh, problem-free, that there are issues with Blitzkrieg. These are not things that are undertaken or th that are fully appreciated by the Germans, or they are things that are ultimately discounted by the Germans because the larger goal of creating autarky, of creating this Lebensraum, creating this massive empire, that still has priority. And this lightning war seems like the only way in which you can establish that. So while there are lessons to be learned from what happens in the West, they don't get applied, either because they're ignored or because uh, it's seen that there's no other way to go forward uh, in the East. Uh, and that the Blitzkrieg model used in Poland and used in France will be much less successful when applied to the Soviet Union. Uh, for reasons I mentioned last time, we're talking about the Japanese and China, for roughly the similar reasons, which is that Blitzkrieg works in ten, tends to work in a fairly confined area where you have either natural obstacles, or in the case of the Soviet army, um, armed obstacles, uh, to further retreat. Blitzkrieg functions by cutting off and demoralizing uh, opposing forces. If opposing forces can simply retreat indefinitely, 
as they can in China and as they can in the Soviet Union, then Blitzkrieg runs into problems. But the Germans, either because they are too confident in this tactic or because they really have no other recourse, they have no other option because they lack resources uh, to fight a long-term war uh, and especially a long-term multiple front war, uh, because of this, uh, the Germans will have to, um, uh, or will suffer uh, after their initial successes in invading the Soviet Union in 1941. Uh, one other point here is that remember, again, this is a war of production, it's a war of material and resources. The failure ultimately to knock out Britain, that is the fact that Britain, the troops escape, Britain is not demoralized, Hitler will, in the fall of 1940 and the spring of 1941, attempt to destroy British air defenses. It will fail. We'll talk more about this when we talk about the whole phenomenon of bombing. Um, but it's going to fail by early 1941. The Germans will never be able to gain air superiority over Britain. What this means, ultimately, is that Britain's never sort of, um, how should I put it, put out of action. And in a war where enormous resources are going to have to be spent to the east, Hitler is going to have to disperse forces here also in the west. Men, material, armaments, supplies, all stockpiled here against uh, a potential invasion coming from Britain. So the failure of uh, the, 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 the fact that the, the conquest of France is not an absolute and unqualified success builds in problems later on for the Germans. Um, I think what we can understand here is basically that, you know, that for the Germans, the necessity of striking east is so paramount because it's only there that you have the resources and the labor um, and the raw materials uh, necessary to sustain yourself against all enemies um, at all times. So this is what happened. You have the, the uh, uh, invasion to the east in Poland. You knock out Poland, divide it up with the Soviets. Then they turn west, ultimately able to take out much of Western Europe, but Britain left uh, uh, in some ways on its own, but not yet defeated. Uh, what I want to do now is turn back to what happens in Poland, because Poland, as I mentioned, is sort of a test case. Poland is going to be the jumping off point for a further invasions to the east, and also Poland, unlike, you know, France, Belgium, Luxembourg, Poland and areas further east are going to be fully subsumed into British, I mean, excuse me, into German imperial control. <coughs> Places out here in the west, they'll have puppet governments in, uh, installed. Uh, they will be, you know, sort of um, subordinates uh, to Germany, but they will not be incorporated into this larger German empire. The areas to the east will, because the Germans have great plans for those areas. Not great in terms of good, great in terms of large scale. Um, for Poland, this is the, um, we'll come back, this is the invasion uh, of the Soviet Union. Um, this is um, uh, the um, uh, sort of a, the division of Poland between 1939 and 1941 uh, into um, uh, various regions. You can see the Soviets control. Uh, this area here, um, the Germans uh, control this area here. <clears throat> For the Germans, Poland, as I said, is sort of the proving ground or the, um, the training ground uh, for what? I'm going to throw yet another German phrase at you. What's known as Generalplan Ost. Or, let's just translate it directly, the general plan for the East. Austin, East. Uh, uh, the general plan for the East, how the East is going to be reconstructed, how it's going to be divided into different administrative units, how it's going to be policed and controlled, how resources are going to be allocated, and most specifically, what's going to happen to the inhabitants of these regions. For the Germans, Generalplan Ost means largely control out to, uh, the, out through the Soviet Union, about as far to the east as Moscow, maybe a little bit further. 
uh, and as far south as the Black Sea. The Germans have no interest in controlling the vast sort of Siberian areas to the northwest, excuse me, to the northeast in the Soviet Union. Uh, they have no desire uh, to become a trans-Siberian power. Uh, the idea, ultimately, that the Germans had was that they were going to conquer so far to the east, and then basically it was going to be a frontier. And that German troops, German youth in general, would stay sharp and stay in sort of fighting spirit by sort of engaging in continual raids and forays out into this Soviet territory. They assumed that, you know, the Soviets wouldn't give up, they'd still be partisans, they'd still be resistors, but they'd have pushed them there. And that you would sort of, they would provide sort of training for future generations of German soldiers uh, by giving them someone to fight. They wouldn't necessarily be a threat, uh, an existential threat to Germany, uh, but they'd still be something of a threat that would need to be policed on the borders. Uh, in essence, sort of, you know, keeping, uh, as the Germans viewed it, the savages walled off and under control. That's the plan. And I mean, if you look, this is what the, um, this is what the Germans ultimately thought they were going to do. Um, this is, it says, uh, utopia. I don't think it's very utopian for anyone who actually had to live there. Uh, but the idea was uh, that, again, you have Germany here. Uh, you have the expansion ultimately in here, uh, uh, past Moscow, down here to the Black Sea. Um, control of resources, but different elements of control as well. That is, and this is something you can see um, in the division of Poland. Uh, some areas will be directly incorporated into Germany. Uh, these areas here in particular that already contain, especially this area here called West Prussia, uh, uh, that contain significant ethnic Germans already. One of the things that the Germans identified about this region, one of the things that the Nazis hoped to do, was that there were pockets of German, uh, of ethnic Germans extending all the way towards Moscow. Uh, that is, you had German settlers who had moved for land. Catherine the Great had encouraged Germans to come in the 1700s uh, and help settle parts uh, of, the, of Western Russia, help bring new farming techniques to Western Russia. So you have these scattered settlements of people who speak Russian, whose families might have been in Russia for 200 years, but who were still ethnic German. Some of them still spoke some German, some of them didn't speak any German. When the, so when the Germans invade the Soviet Union in June 1941, these populations are immediately targeted by the Soviet army and either exterminated or shipped off to the gulags, which was really the same thing. Um, but you have, what you have is you have the incorporation of um, uh, some elements uh, directly into it, and then you have these areas here, what's called the general government, that's going to be occupied. It's going to be basically a German colony. That's the, the level of what you're going to have. You're going to have absolute incorporation into Germany itself, and then areas like this where there's not a lot of German, uh, there's not a, a German ethnic population, uh, this is going to basically become a colonial unit with a German command, German force, um, with very few Poles given any sort of positions, at least that's the idea, positions of political or administrative responsibility. The idea is you can do it with Germans from the occupying force or with ethnic Germans who happen to be already there. This is the idea. And, and uh, this model here, while it's never fully extended any further east because they never are able to fully control this territory, um, this is the model that was going to be used for the Soviet Union, creating sort of a colonial administration and colonial bureaucracy uh, and a subservient laboring population. Um, one of the things that um, uh, is, you might say, sort of a precursor to this for the Germans, um, the idea is that you're going to resettle some Germans into here to control land you're going to be able to supply them with labor, cheap labor, basically slave labor. Uh, Poles and ultimately uh, Belarusians, Ukrainians, and others. The first step to that is removing 
people who own land, removing people who pose a threat, removing people who might stand between, you might say, Polish, the Polish peasantry and the German occupying force. And in fact, the Germans in 1939 through 41 spend much more time on this clearing out than they do on the resettling. They will try to get all sorts of ethnic Germans from northern Italy, from um, uh, Austria, uh, from uh, parts of uh, even uh, far west, far, me, far eastern France, to try to move into this area. They'll try and, and sort of uh, sell this as, you know, sort of the new empire, almost <laughs> a, sort of a manifest destiny idea. But, you know, go out and settle this land. There's lots of land to take, lots of free labor. Um, uh, as it turns out, they'll have, they'll have trouble uh, attracting a lot of people to it. Um, but this is the idea. And so you've got to clear this all out. You're going to bring in basically all Germans in this area. Out here, you're going to bring in selected ethnic Germans to basically control land and the population uh, that is uh, largely as farmers. So you have a massive clearance that goes on in um, uh, the first uh, 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 year or two of uh, German and Soviet occupation. The Soviets, I should say, are doing the same thing in their parts of Poland. That is, the Soviets, uh, especially this area around here, uh, the Soviets attempt to resettle populations as well. That is, the Soviets don't like having sort of mixed populations. They want Ukrainians in Ukraine, Belarusians in Belarus. Poles in Poland. People who refuse to abide by those boundaries are those who tend to be carted off to the gulag or shot. Uh, so on both sides, you're having this ethnic reorganization and even, you might say, this sort of ethnic cleansing going on. Um, in 1939 and early 1940, in this area here, about 500 Polish villages are destroyed, razed to the ground. you have a population of about one and a half million Poles pushed into this area. Largely rural, uh, 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 mostly Polish peasants, including a significant number of rural Polish, rural Polish Jews, all being pushed back towards Warsaw and what is called the general government, that is the sort of colonial part of Poland. Uh, the idea is, again, you're going to depopulate this area, first of all, bring in as many Germans as you can, then you'll bring back Poles, basically as slave labor, if needed. So you're pushing them further to the east. Um, you have, ultimately, about um, 200,000 Poles killed in this first two years of the war. Um, uh, Many of them, uh, and that's simply on the German side. You also have tens of thousands killed on the Soviet side. The Soviets also had a desire to basically eliminate this stratum of society. Same thing the Germans wanted to do. Get rid of the people between the peasantry and the German occupying force. That meant educated people, landowners, teachers, professionals, etc. Um, uh, in uh, the fall of 1939 alone, uh, the Germans kill 17,000 teachers in the western part of Poland. Uh, and they target all sorts of other people who are deemed as politically dangerous, people who are uh, deemed uh, to be potential sort of resistors, uh, potential sort of organizers uh, of Polish uh, nationalism. Uh, you have a lot of these people rounded up and killed or deported as slave labor back into Germany. Um, and this is where, in Poland, is where you begin to start to see um, the, the emergence of, you might say, sort of the elimination idea in, uh, that comes to mark what we think of as the Holocaust. Uh, that is, in the western part of Poland, as the Germans move in, both the regular German army and the SS basically the sort of indoctrinated Nazi divisions within uh, the German army, um, they target potential resistors, people who were, tar teamed to who were termed at times politicals 
or subversives, which means not only targeting professionals, not only targeting um, uh, 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 the educated uh, uh, nationalists, uh, clergy members at times, but also Jews. That is, the, um, the general order given to the SS in particular to create quote-unquote stability in this region is at times extended to the actual extermination of Jews as a potentially disaffected, potentially troublesome population. What you have in, so what you have in Poland is you don't have the specific targeting of Jews, rather you have the targeting of all trouble or potential sort of troublemakers, as the Germans understand them. That's a model they're going to carry into the Soviet Union. And it won, it's one which, see, which means that by the spring of 1940 to the end of 1940, the early 1941, you start to see more and more mass executions, not just of uh, uh, potential Polish resistors, but of Polish Jews, men, women, and children. Uh, because this um, idea of their sort of being subversive populations or troublesome populations um, extends outward to Jews. That is, you have in the SS units in particular this thorough indoctrination in anti-Semitism. You have commanders and others who very quickly make the leap from saying we're dealing with people who are politically subversive to people who are just understood as anti-German, whether in their views or simply in their existence. So you start to see, as I said, by early 1940 and, and extending into 1941, organized massacres of Jews in Western Poland. Uh, mass executions, um, usually using machine guns, special police or SS squads, uh, mass sort of burials. As I said, the destruction of villages, um, reprisals. Um, at times, the German army was so out of control uh, that one German general, when he, when he brought his troops... Uh, into uh, a newly conquered area of Poland, he took away all their ammunition. Because he said, this is the area that surrendered. We've taken all the prisoners. Um, I'm not going to give you the ability to actually, you know, um, uh, kill anyone else. But that's the sort of level of distrust that some commanders had of their troops in this situation. Uh, because the rhetoric about Slavs, the rhetoric about Jews, the rhetoric about sort of, you know, troublesome populations meant that soldiers felt and were oftentimes granted sort of license to do what they wanted. Uh, in fact, uh, Hitler in 1940 is going to issue a general amnesty to everyone who was in Poland. Uh, that, that is, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've perpetrated, you are, in essence, forgiven uh, and pardoned. Um, and the Germans, I mean, the Germans were not only content, not only sort of, you know, content to move into this region, but they were stripping out of Poland anything they could take. As I said, at least a million people moved back to Poland, moved back to Germany as slave labor. Um, all sorts of uh, looting. Uh, there was a joke in Poland, in, in Warsaw, a very sort of, you know, uh, black humor joke, uh, which said that, you know, thank goodness there was a travel agency because at least now you could go to Berlin and visit your furniture. Uh, but you have this um, uh, sort of generalized looting. The idea is you're going to clear the place of subversive elements, of people who are on the land. The Soviets out here, they are interested in a couple of types of people in particular. They're interested in Polish nationalists, the Catholic clergy, and um, uh, landowners, because they want to remake this part of Poland into sort of the Soviet model. Uh, they are not uh, uh, going to be massacring Jews in the same way that the Germans will here. Both sides will identify these sort of troublesome populations. The Germans will come to include Jews uh, as because of simply their existence uh, in this sort of um, uh, uh, category. Uh, the Soviets will carry out massacres of Polish army officers in particular. Um, uh, they, um, uh, in 1940, uh, kill about 20,000 21,000, excuse me, to be exact, uh, Polish officers in a place called the Katyn Forest. K-A-T-Y-N. The Katyn Forest um, in eastern Poland. Um, they also send many 
uh, uh, Polish soldiers that they captured. Not they're not just kept in sort of prisoner of war camps, uh, but they're shipped as slave labor or back to the gulags uh, in the Soviet Union itself. Um, and this is something um, when the Germans move into eastern Poland in the spring of 1941 as they launch their attack on the Soviet Union, they uncover the Katyn massacre site, the Katyn Forest massacre site. And they make a big deal out of it, saying this is what the Soviets have done. The Soviets say, no, this is absolutely staged. And everyone at that point who's now allied with the Soviets against the Germans, the Americans, the British, uh, or at least assuming the British, um, they buy the Soviet account that this is a Nazi hoax. Um, it wasn't. The Soviets did, um, in their attempt to sort of incorporate Poland, the Soviets did kill these 21,000 uh, officers uh, and buried them in this mass grave. Uh, and it's something which the Soviet, which uh, is uh, confirmed or was confirmed, you know, within the last 20 years by work in Soviet archives or the archives of the Soviet era. Um, lots of these, what's interesting is lots of the Poles who were not killed, Polish soldiers, and were shipped back to the Gulag, when the Germans invade the Soviet Union in 1941, the Soviets go back to the Poles and say, how would you like to fight for us? The Poles are... Um, uh, they respond. They say, we won't fight directly for you, but we'll help you. Get us out of here, and we will fight under British command elsewhere. And they form this separate Polish army, ultimately, uh, about 50 or 60,000 strong, uh, most of whom are rescued. Some of them had, had their families taken to the gulags with them uh, in 1939, 1940. Uh, the Soviets come and let them go, and they're all taken by train down to Iraq. Uh, where the British form them into this separate Polish uh, army uh, that will then go on to fight in parts of the Middle East and will go on to fight in Italy, too. Um, uh, their wives and children, who also managed to get out of the Gulag, no one knows what to do with them. Uh, so ultimately, the British sort of shoved them to Bombay in British India for the duration of the war. Um, and then after the war, tries, the British try to say, we have nothing to do with these Poles. We don't know how they got here. They just need to go home. The Polish army that they got out of the gulags and the Polish civilians in India both refused to go home because the home is actually part of the Soviet Union now. They had been um, removed by the Soviets from eastern Poland uh, in 1939-40 uh, when the Soviets pushed the Germans all the way back uh, in 1944-45. Uh, the Soviets are going to take a huge slice of Poland for themselves again. Uh, and um, uh, these people have absolutely no desire to go back. After about four years, the British are ultimately, you might say, persuaded, some might say shamed, into actually taking them all back to Britain. Um, the Polish-born population of Britain, you know, quadruples in size uh, overnight uh, because they bring back 60 or 70,000 Poles, soldiers and their dependents, um, uh, who had basically said, we will not go back to Soviet-dominated Poland. Uh, we've seen the gulags. No, really, we have. And um, uh, we're not going back to that. So you have this clearance that goes on. The idea being, you're going to introduce German settlers, you're going to introduce German control, uh, German land ownership throughout this region. As I've said, it's kind of a problem because while well, you have ethnic Germans who move there, not enough go there. You cannot convince people from uh, part of Czechoslovakia or northern Italy to move into Poland, despite the way it's extolled as sort of the new frontier, um, opening up of land, guarantee of free labor. They don't get enough people. And the Germans, for all of their talk about racial superiority, racial supremacy, racial hierarchy, the Germans start to fudge things in order to make this work. Uh, that is... Um, uh, by the middle of 1940, they begin to introduce a program called, not Germanization, because that, you know, you couldn't actually make someone into a German. Their racial ideas wouldn't allow for that. But it was a program called re-Germanization. That is the idea, this, the, the, this war produces some rather strange programs. At the end of the war, the Americans will engage in what's called denazification, which sounds as if, you know, you just gave someone a bath and said, oh, you're not a Nazi anymore. Uh, Regermanization meant that there were enough people in Poland who you could find some evidence of German ancestry buried somewhere in there that you could, in essence, rehabilitate them, reactivate their Germanness, 
and put aside all that Slavic stuff. Um, uh, ultimately, the Germans felt that about 10% of the population could be re-Germanized. Um, by the time the Germans get further, by after June 1941, as they extend into the Ukraine and Belarus, um, because they can't find anyone who wants to come and settle, especially when you know this conquest doesn't seem quite uh, uh, complete or consolidated, um, they ultimately make the decision that about a quarter, for example, of all Ukrainians are actually Germans, if you dig deep enough, uh, and so that they can be successfully re-Germanized. Uh, this is one of the things that the Germans uh, come to realize, is that there are not enough willing Germans to go out and basically consolidate this Lebensraum. And so you're going to have to find Germans who may be German. You're going to have to convince people that they are German despite their great protestations. Uh, but about a quarter of, of Ukrainians are deemed eligible for re-Germanization. Um, uh, and you'll have, actually, in Ukraine, in Belarus, uh, in parts of the Baltics, um, you will have some native support for the Germans. Not necessarily because they embrace everything that Hitler stands for, but because Hitler's not Stalin. Um, uh, same reason you may have some in the Soviet Union fight so hard against the Germans because Stalin is not Hitler. It's, you know, you're really something kind of caught. Um, as I've mentioned before, a historian of this region who wrote a book about this recently called it simply Bloodlands because of the amount of bloodshed, the amount of ethnic cleansing, the amount of uh, sort of population, the numbers in population rearranged over the course of the war. Uh, so you have an attempt to re-Germanize. Um, you have children in orphanages in Poland and in parts of the Western Soviet Union. Uh, their parents either killed uh, by the Germans, sent back as slave labor. You actually have a large number of orphans in this region. The Germans decide that they can be re-Germanized too if you simply get them young enough. And they will send them back to Germany. Uh, and uh, uh, they will um, uh, uh, basically be sent to special boarding schools, special training academies, to be brought up as good little Germans. Uh, and to give you an idea, just some statistics of this, one district in Poland that's been studied intensively for this, um, in one month alone, gives you an idea of sort of how mass casualties were, in one month alone after the German invasion of Poland, this district sent 4,500 children to Germany in the first year of the war, as you mean, one month of the first year of the war. Um, children who would be sort of brought up and basically retrained as Germans. It solved for the Germans two problems. They didn't have enough Germans in Poland, and they also had the problem of all these orphans. So what they did is they sent them back. Um, and and um, there's further um, uh, uh, sort of uh, population which the Germans sort of glommed onto. That is, children born to Polish women, either in occupied Poland or Polish women who have been enslaved and sent back to labor in Germany. Sometimes a product of, you might say, consensual relationships, sometimes a product of violent forced sexual assault. But you have all these children who are considered technically German. They can be brought back too. During the war, it's estimated about 40,000 children were born to Polish women living in Germany. Not even just Polish women in Poland, but Polish women who have been enslaved and sent to Germany. Those children are all taken from their mothers. They're going to be raised, or the category that they're considered in is something called the Lebensborn. Okay, so they're born in Germany. They can be, through living in Germany, fully Germanized or re-Germanized. Um, the, the orphans would also be called the Lebensborn. The idea that by being living, by living in Germany, they could become German themselves. So you have this effort to, um, uh, to translate the goal of Lebensraum into actual administrative um, change and structural change in Germany, I mean, excuse me, in Poland, it doesn't necessarily take the Germans 
eliminate large sections of the Polish population, but they are unable to take the next step, which is the introduction of large numbers of ethnic Germans. So they, they do a rehearsal, but it's more sort of a structural rehearsal. You don't get the numbers of people. You'll get, ultimately, about 100,000 Germans who will move into Poland after 1939, enticed by various sort of grants of land and property uh, by the Nazis. Um, but it's nowhere near the numbers they think they're going to get. Uh, and the result is that they begin to look for ways to sort of introduce more Germans uh, through other means. As they move into the Soviet Union, you're not even going to get the institutional setup. That is, the Germans will never be able to fully set up something like the general government in parts of the occupied Soviet Union uh, because it will still be um, so tenuous. Uh, the conquest will not be consolidated nearly in the way it is uh, in, uh, in Poland. The Germans are able to consolidate in Poland because for the first couple of years that they're there, they have the Soviets occupying the other, part, the other half or the other roughly third or so of Poland. That gives the Germans the ability to have sort of security here, security behind them, build up administrative structures here. Once they move into the Soviet Union, they don't have that. They are going to be continually under pressure. They will continually be pushing forward, trying to consolidate their control, Un unable ultimately uh, to do so. So what you see here, uh, I think a couple of important takeaways. In Poland, you do see sort of in microcosm what the Germans plan. You see the impossibility or the really the sort of improbability that the Germans will be able to pull off this plan. And you also see the beginning of mass executions, not just of people deemed politically troublesome or subversive, but you start to see by 1940 the mass targeted execution of Polish Jews. Um, who are seen as um, uh, inimical, as um, uh, antithetical, you might say, or, or sort of, you know, uh, unwelcome in any German-governed state. That is going to be translated, this sort of ad hoc, only loosely organized violence, is going to be translated ultimately into the much more institutionalized violence that marks what we think of as the Holocaust, or the final stage of the Holocaust, the extermination stage, which runs from 1942 onward and coincides with the German conquest of all of this region here, which brings millions of Jews under German control, uh, and uh, which, uh, to which the German response ultimately uh, is that they cannot get rid of these um, populations, these so-called anti-German populations, by any other means than mass extermination. And by 1941, they're beginning to search for how they might do this, rather than simply relying on mass executions and mass graves. Uh, we'll be turning to that when we talk about the Holocaust, um, but I'm going to leave it there uh, for today, and I will uh, see you all on Thursday. Thank you.